Members, it is now question time, and uh, I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I apologise for not being in the House uh, prior to the Easter break for a question to the Principal Deputy Speaker, and ask question number one. <coughs> Minister. Can I call you with your permission? Junior Minister Riley will answer this question. High streets are at the heart of our society in more ways than one. They drive the economy, but they also create shared spaces where society thrives. The task force report was published in March 2022, and former junior ministers at that time paid tribute to the work done by the task force and welcomed the strategic narrative. The recommendations will be of interest to a number of government departments, and we will shortly write to executive colleagues inviting them to consider how they will take forward the findings of the report. Call, call Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, in my own town of Corain, where we have lost uh, Marks and Sparks uh, to out-of-town shopping, we have, we have lost our footfall by 14 per cent since then. I am wondering, is there any plans to, to, for the high, ta high, high Street Task Force to try and reverse this trend from shops in the town centre to out-of-town shopping? Uh, yeah. Minister. Mr. Girl, I thank the member for his um, his, his, uh, his question. Sorry. Um, yes. Listen. It, it's in terms of, of the high streets. Um, you know, we, we massively rely on local businesses, local footfall. We rely on people going into our high streets. Um, in terms of the bigger companies, um, you know, unfortunately, that's just where society is going. But of course, we want to support them. We we absolutely want to see more people going into town centres. We want to see them. Um, shopping local, so um, apologies. Yeah, so we, we absolutely encourage more people to go into town centres. Um, thank you. Well, Nicola Brogan. Um, could the Minister outline what support has been made to high street traders recently that were affected by severe flooding? Let it Minister. Yeah, uh, it was of course heartbreaking to see so many family businesses, people who have built up their trade over generations, lose so much after the recent floods. These small and medium-sized businesses are the lifeblood of our local town centres. Um, and a number of steps ha have, however, been taken to help them overcome the impacts of the devastating floods. Under the Flood Damage Business Grant Scheme, 143 eligible businesses across three affected council areas were paid 7,500 each before the 15th of December, at a total cost of £1,072,500. On December the 21st, the Civil Service further announced details of financial support for businesses severely affected by the flooding, which will be targeted at assisting small and medium-sized businesses. The support will be linked to the actual costs incurred by businesses in relation to the replacement of damaged or destroyed equipment, refitting of flooded property and repair of damage to buildings. Subject to meeting relevant criteria, businesses will also receive 100% relief from non-domestic rates on flooded properties for the period between the 29th of October 23 and the 31st of March 24. The Department for the Economy, led by my colleague Conor Murphy, are in discussion with the local authorities over delivery of additional support up to 100,000 per business. So I urge any trader who believes that they may be eligible to check the criteria and submit an application. Mr. Speaker, um, thank you, Junior Minister, for your answer so far. Can I ask what budget exists for a high street and challenge fund in line with recommendations three and nine of the report? Thank you. Minister. Um, and I thank the member for her question. Her question. Um, first of all, in terms of the report itself, we, we agree with the principles of the recommendations that were brought forward at the time. Um, we've, we firmly believe that high streets must be supported. Um, but a more detailed consideration of how the task force recommendations um, and how we bring that forward um, and any impacts since the report was published, such as the cost of living crisis, the budget reposition developments in place, based working will be a matter for the executive to consider. We call Mr. Speaker, question two. Mr. Minister. The Deputy First Minister and I travelled to Washington DC for a series of St. Patrick's Day engagements. We travelled from the 13th to the 17th of March. We represented the four-party coalition of the executive and its shared objectives as part of that uh, engagement. This was our first international visit and an important opportunity to consolidate the strong relationship that our region uh, enjoys with the US. 
This relationship was crucial to our peace process and continues through today in terms of investment, knowledge sharing and support. And we continue to have access at the highest levels in the US, including a meeting with President Biden at the White House, to deliver a clear message that government here is back up and running. And it is vital that we seek every opportunity to attract investment, grow our economy and deliver for our citizens. Our visit focused on showcasing the local economy, our, our local economy as a compelling investment opportunity and highlighting the many benefits of doing business here. We were also able to deliver these messages at key events such as the Ireland Funds event, the Bureau Breakfast, the Special Envoys event, as well as having a roundtable discussion with the US Chamber of Commerce and business leaders. Events such as the Speaker of the House of Representatives luncheon, our fireside chat at Georgetown University. We had receptions hosted by both the British and Irish ambassadors to the US. That all gave us huge opportunities to further our engagements with some of the most influential decision makers so that they too can see the potential that we have to offer. Ms. Bramley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank you for the update. Um, I welcome the very positive announcement of the huge investment um, of the in-kind donation from the US computer software company Alterax. Um, I would ask the First Minister how confident she is that we can build upon this fantastic news, um, positive news for Northern Ireland. First Minister. Yeah, thank you. And we, as you uh, you've, uh, referenced, one of the companies that's chosen to invest here, which is really, really positive. And I can tell the House that the, the whole for the five days that we were there was hugely um, beneficial for us. There was huge goodwill. The, the chair of the TEO committee was there also, as was the education minister, the economy minister, the speaker. And we took every platform open to us and every engagement open to us uh, in terms of selling our words, as I, as I described it. But the investment potential that we have there, sometimes these things don't come overnight. I mean, it's inevitable that you have to build these relationships, um, both the diplomatic relationships, but also equally alongside that, these economic opportunities. And we were all on message in terms of saying that we are open for business, that we have a unique selling point in terms of dual market access, that we have a young workforce, that we have a, a happy population. Believe it or not, you wouldn't believe that sometimes when you hear the, the media headlines. But um, we had lots of, of really positive things um, to say. And given that we're such a small, um, outward-looking economy, it's really, really important if we're going to fulfil our potential and reach our potential in terms of investing in, in the people that we serve then we take these opportunities and our key message the whole way through, this is about prosperity for our people. And I look forward to actually further engagements now to follow up on the, the linkages that we made, including a visit from Joe Kennedy, I think next week, which again was about um, furthering other opportunities and potentially having a future investment um, opportunity and perhaps even a delegation again advising. And then there'll be further opportunities for us to, to go back again in terms of following up on some of these things. Steve McLaughlin. Speaker, can the First Minister um, list any further investments that were secured as a result of her engagements in the US? Um, we, we've heard of one. Are there others in the pipeline? Is it a strong pipeline? First Minister. Yes, I mean, I think that the, the, the opportunity that we had um, six, seven weeks into a reformed executive gave us a huge opportunity. And I can tell you, as I said, the positivity was um, fantastic. And not just, I mean, obviously, yes, from investors, because we were there to say we were open for business. Um, and I do believe that there will be a lot more that will come in the pipeline. And it didn't come just as a result of the visit um, a few weeks ago. That obviously furthered relations that were built. But we had the investment conference and the Joe Kennedy delegation previous to that. Um, and all these things take, it, it is exactly a pipeline. It takes a bit of time to, to progress them. So I think that, if, as I said, if we're going to fulfill our, our ambition for our people and to make us a more prosperous part of the world, then we have to follow through on these. And I'm actually quite positive in terms of what we can achieve and I think it's important on the economic front it was important in terms of diplomatic relations but it was also important in terms of philanthropy and looking towards other funds that are there that actually want to help us and um, to deliver the things that we want to deliver here particularly given the financial outlook that we have in terms of the, the budget allocation that we have here so I suspect that over the course of time we will see many more uh, positive announcements I know that both myself and the first minister our deputy first minister are determined to continue this work as is our economic uh, minister who is determined to work with Invest NA, Enterprise Ireland, Intertrade Ireland. Let's scope out massively all these opportunities that we have and make sure that we achieve better jobs, better paid jobs, more jobs for the people that we all serve. Justin McKelty. Um, I would thank the ministers for their answers thus far. With the ongoing genocide and slaughter of the Palestinian people, what representations did you make to the powers that be in the United States in relation to calling for a ceasefire and calling for humanitarian aid to the impoverished people and slaughtered people of, genocide, of, of Palestine? First Minister. 
Uh, thanks uh, to the member and absolutely concur in terms of what's happening to the, the people of Palestine and that genocide must end and must end now. Six months on, it is harrowing to watch the scenes. The people in that region need support. They need an urgent ceasefire. They need humanitarian aid. They need a political solution. And I took, personally took the opportunity on two occasions to say that directly to the President of the United States because it's important that you know, we know that the United States have been a firm friend in terms of the Irish peace process and helping us achieve the everything that we achieved 25 years ago. And I just asked that that same approach be applied to the Middle East and in terms of trying to achieve an immediate um, ceasefire. So took two opportunities. It was a platform not to be missed on behalf of the people of Palestine and to call for that immediate ceasefire. And I used every opportunity that I had to do that. Alex Easton. Question number three. First Minister. With your permission, uh, um, Junior Minister Riley is going to answer that question. The Central Good Relations Fund is an annual merit-based programme designed to deliver and support projects in areas where there is a good relations need. Funding is awarded subject to a budget to those groups who score most highly in the assessment process. Welcome statements are used to identify particular thematic or geographic areas from which applications would be welcomed. In 2023-24, we were able to fund projects across all council areas to the great benefit of communities and people who live here. Unfortunately, though, due to the challenging financial position of 2023-24, difficult decisions had to be made, which included cuts to the Central Good Relations Fund. This resulted in many worthy projects being unable to secure funding through CGRF. We would like to commend the ongoing efforts of groups in the community and voluntary sector who work tirelessly to improve the lives of people here, especially when times are challenging. Central Good Relations Fund applications for 24-25 are currently under assessment, and that process will be completed before the end of April 24. Letters of offer will be issued to successful projects after a budget for the programme in 24-25 has been confirmed. Mr. Easton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, how will the Department ensure that the Good Relations Fund will address the specific needs and challenges faced by marginalised communities, particularly women? who often bear the brunt of economic disparities and lack of resources. Minister. Well, just in terms of how the, um, the good relations um, is, is measured um, at a project level, impacts are, are measured by looking at challenges in knowledge, attitude and behaviour towards those from a different background from participation in good relations projects. Um, it's also done through funded stakeholders' project reports, which often detail case studies highlighting the personal impacts of good relations participation. And more broadly, independent evaluations are conducted to assess impact and inform future delivery. Uh, officials do continue to work with key stakeholders to review and improve the evaluation process uh, to fully capture the positive impacts of good relations work. <clears throat> Can the Minister please provide an update on the delivery of the Together Building a United Community Strategy at all? Uh, there has been significant progress in delivering the Together Building a United Community Strategy since its implementation. Over 30,000 young people have taken part in 870 TBUC camps, five urban villages, areas have been established and the target of building 10 shared neighbourhoods has been met. Over 27,000 participants took part in the Uniting Communities programme of sporting events and young leader training. Over 6,000 young people participated in the United Youth programme. The first shared education campus at Libavati is now operational, with work expected to commence soon on the Ballycastle shared education campus. The executive has also expressed its commitment for the Struhl campus in Oma. Um, approximately one third of interface barriers have been removed, with a further third reduced in stature. Work continues across other interface sites to secure the conditions needed for reduction or removal. And just in recent weeks, both Junior Minister Cameron and myself have been attending many, many events um, on good relations. Um, we were in Derry, Newry, Ballymena, Newton Abbey and Belfast. And in all these engagements, were, which are connecting communities, are further evidence that the T-Book strategy has facilitated meaningful progress and change at local level. And I want to commend the efforts of all the community and statutory partners involved in working to build a better future for all. I think I also want to acknowledge, just in terms of the community and voluntary sector, all the participants, all the, the volunteers, the staff, in terms of th those programmes who really go out and do tremendous, tremendous work um, and really make a difference to the people, not only who need, who need the programmes, um, but actually benefit from them massively. Um, and uh, I just want to commend all those for them. Matthew Till.
Mr. Speaker, Junior Minister, would you agree that notwithstanding all the good work and good relations you've mentioned, the executive's decision not to put back the ring fence for integrated uh, schools uh, and to effectively um, collude with the UK government in removing that funding from, uh, from integrated schools damages the good relations agenda? Minister. Yeah, I think we're all aware, just in terms of when the executive was, was restored just over eight weeks ago now, we are in a very difficult budgetary situation. Um, we, we know that, that we, we are underfunded. Um, and as I said, the executive has encountered a challenging budget position in 23-24, and difficult decisions had to be made. Um, but to, to inform the decision-making process and how the budget was allocated, um, just to let the member know, an equality impact assessment uh, was carried out. Initial feedback received from that EQIA public consultation was considered, and an allocation of 1.4 million was made to the Central Good Relations Fund. In addition to the EQIA, a children's rights impact assessment and a rural needs impact assessment was also undertaken. We do understand the impact that these reductions had on local communities and want to be clear that we remain fully supportive of good relations delivery moving forward. Uh, question four has been withdrawn. I call Orla Flynn. I can call you. Um, Kesht Ever Akui. Question number five, please. First Minister. We have spoken previously about our key priorities, including childcare, reducing hospital waiting lists, tackling violence against women and girls, special educational needs, Loch Ness, housing, and developing a globally competitive economy. A considerable amount of other work is also underway. The Executive's most immediate priority remains the stabilisation of public finances. It is important to us that everyone in our society feels the benefits of the decisions that we make. Work is now moving at pace to develop a new programme for government with plans for a fully agreed programme for government being placed for the summer. We will provide an update to the Assembly in due course, and of course the Assembly will also have an opportunity to discuss that also. Ms Gwynne. Um, thanks very much. I thank the First Minister for her answer, um, and also welcome the clear commitment um, the Chip mentioned there in terms of improved childcare provision for families here in the North. Does the Minister agree with me that um, this provision it must be affordable for parents and for families, and that any solution in terms of childcare that we're looking at it needs to be a bespoke solution that's going to suit every family and the importance around the affordability? Uh, First Minister. Thank you for, for that supplementary. I mean, absolutely, and I think I'm really pleased to say that um, collectively the four parties around the executive table have prioritised the issue of affordable childcare. And whilst we all might have slight differences in terms of a policy approach, work is underway to try to find that agreed um, way forward. And I know that, as, as the member reflected, childcare costs are just far too high, far too unaffordable, and places aren't available um, in many areas. And that's at a time whenever families are already so stretched, the cost of living crisis and all the additional uh, costs that people are facing right now. So the provision of affordable and accessible childcare is key to ensuring that all of our young people get the very best start in life. Um, and, whilst that, and that will also obviously allow more people to participate in the workforce. So that's been a very consistent and clear message that um, both the Deputy First Minister and I have heard. And um, we've been out visiting different um, childcare centres, kinder kids and uh, the, the, at the Ashton Centre and in North Belfast Shankill Women's Centre. And we've said that, and we recognise absolutely, as does everybody, I believe, that investing in childcare is a long term funding uh, programme, and that, that's something that we need um, to commit to. So that's why we have uh, taken the issue in terms of the, the financial situation directly to the Prime Minister in terms of the current financial package, because it does limit our ability to be able to do the things, as I said, that we want to do. However, um, I'm committed to working with the Education Minister. I can say that the Education Minister focused on this issue as well in the United States, which again, we're looking towards areas of good example and good practice and, and ways of doing things. Um, but I think that any childcare strategy has to be something that provides high care, quality childcare, makes it affordable for parents and provides sustainability for the workforce, which is a predominantly female um, workforce. And I think that's what families are looking towards this executive, this new executive to do. And I hope that we can make this a, a real meaningful project that we actually deliver in this mandate. Jim Allister. Do victims' issues feature in the strategic priorities? And if so, why does the, why does the First Minister, though uh, deploying weasel words about regretting all deaths, why does she refuse persistently to, by insulting IRA victims, by refusing to condemn provisional IRA murders, including those recently highlighted in the Canova report. Were those murders wrong? 
First Minister. As I, I said in the aftermath of the Canova report, and as I said on taking up the office of First Minister, I regret every single loss of life. I regret that people were born into this society where conflict was all around them. And I think our job as political leaders is actually try to help to heal the wounds of the past. Our job as political leaders is actually try to help to look towards the future and help families in terms of moving forward. Not to move on, but to move forward. That's the responsible and also the pragmatic and also the mature thing to do. Colin Here that the programme for government that executive parties have been working on for over a year now will be published in the summer. But given that it will be required to be uh, consulted upon, would the First Minister give a commitment that it will be published before the recess in summer to give people the opportunity over the summer to assess it? First Minister. Um, well, I can just to confirm and maybe correct the record for, for the member. The executive has formed, I think, nine or ten weeks now. That's the official conversation we've been having around programme for government. Um, I'm glad to say that uh, work is continuing to pace in terms of trying to develop that programme for government. I'm more interested in getting it right. I'm more interested in making sure we've got a programme for government that reflects our priorities, as we have the four parties of the executive actually have identified. So what I've said is that we will. Uh, be bringing this to the executive. We will have some discussion this week, but the intention is that we will have something formally in place for the summer of this year. And then we have to go through the consultation process and work through all the details of it. But let's get it right. Let's not be in a hurry. Let's make sure it's meaningful and impactful. Call Kate Nicholl. Mr. Speaker. First Minister. Um, the provision of housing, including those uh, granted refugee status, is the responsibility of the housing executive. Um, following the introduction of the Home Office's streamlined asylum process, the pace and volume of asylum decisions has increased significantly. Whilst we welcome work to reduce the backlog and facilitate the decision-making process, the increase in so-called move-ons, where people move out of um, Home Office accommodation to, for example, housing executive properties, continues to have a significant impact on services and support locally, including in terms of housing. TEO officials have a coordination role and engage regularly at regional and local level on this issue. A multi-agency move-on coordination group, which also includes members from TEO, the Housing Executive, the Departments of Education, Health, Communities, the Education Authority, continues to meet um, fortnightly so that they can coordinate the devolved response to that. We also engage through the move-on delivery board which is chaired by Home Office and is attended by TEO and Housing Executive officials alongside a range of stakeholders from across the regions. Uh, call thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and thank you, First Minister, for your answer. Um, would you agree with me that whilst housing is a responsibility of the Housing Executive, integration is very much a responsibility of your department, and while the work um, uh, within TEO is welcome, there are issues with the governance around this, and people are falling through the gaps, specifically children who have been in Mears housing, then they get moved to different schools because they go into it. housing executive accommodation, then they finally get their final house, and it's incredibly disruptive, and it is impacting integration, and more needs to be done around this. Thank you. I thank the member and I concur with the issues which you've raised and I think that's really, really important in terms of the governance that we're actually listening to people that are going through this lived experience, especially also those people that are on the ground actually helping them every day. So I do welcome the work that's been done. I welcome the fact, but I also recognise there's more to be done, um, just to make that point. And whilst this isn't a devolved issue per se, there are issues that then fall to our responsibility and we have to make sure we're doing the right things. Uh, excuse me. So that's why I welcome the fact that um, we plan to bring a final refugee integration strategy to the executive in the coming months and work's been going on to align the draft strategy to, so to make sure that we enhance the support that's there for refugee and asylum seekers um, and no doubt we'll want to talk about that more uh, in the time ahead but that also does include as I said the establishment of making sure that we have the right structures in place in terms of the governance I mean I welcome the fact that we now have more stakeholder engagement more people are able to bring the issues of concern that they have to the table and then we discuss them and work out how we can lobby on them. So I, I think we should always have an open mind to, if something isn't right, try and fix it. Um, and that's the approach certainly that we'll take in TEO. Ms. Um, First Minister, could you provide an update um, on the support for those people avoiding the war in Ukraine? First Minister. Thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. We continue to play our part, our, our part even, in supporting Ukrainians uh, fleeing war. We've had over 3,100 arrivals here so far. 
and more than £620,000 is being paid in immediate cash support just to help people get established. We have coordinated work across departments to support arrivals and facilitated payments of over £3 million to, to more than 900 individual homes, so those people that have actually opened their doors to help uh, and be Ukraine's sponsors. We're also very mindful that some of our first arrivals under the Homes for Ukraine Sponsorship Scheme will be entering the final year of their current visa, and that was a worrying moment for, for people. So therefore, we've welcomed the announcement made by Home Office back on the 19th of February that has confirmed the opportunity to apply for an extended Homes for Ukraine visa for a further 18 months for those that wish to remain. And as with all of these matters, given that the policy responsibility sits um, in London, um, we're going to continue to engage with the Home Office in London and the Department of Leveling Up on work, work to support Ukrainian arrivals. Um, I call uh, Brian Kingston. Um, to ask the First Minister, what impact has the, the Legal Migration Act 2023 had and what engagement has the Executive Office had with the Home Office uh, around it? First Minister. Given that it hasn't come into full effect yet, we're still working out the implications for here. Um, so we have to continue with the Home Office as more of this um, becomes clear in terms of the legislation, what it means here in terms of uh, our responsibilities and what falls to us. But um, certainly, um, even though the Act came into effect in July of last year, most of the clauses haven't been commenced yet. So I think we need to get more detail in terms of what it'll mean. Um, but we do continue, as I said, to liaise with the, the Home Office on plans that they have to enact the remaining clauses and then also what those implications are. And we have established a task and finish group, which is chaired by TEO officials, which will actually um, take that piece of work forward. Question 7 has been withdrawn. I call Donnelly Donnelly. Question 8, please. First Minister. Ensuring that the needs of victims and survivors continue to be met in the most effective and appropriate manner remains a key priority for the Executive. The role of the Commissioner is critical in supporting this work through ensuring that victims and survivors have a strong and independent voice and contributing to the development of policies so that their longer term needs are addressed. We are therefore keen that a new Commissioner is appointed as soon as possible and our officials are continuing to progress the administrative preparations required for the recruitment competition to appoint the new Commissioner. The appointment process itself is regulated by the Commissioner for Public Appointments, and we estimate that the whole process will take approximately six months. Mr. Donnelly. Um, the Minister has just answered my supplementary, so thank okay. you, Minister. I appreciate it. Oh, sorry. Could Linda Dill. And Corlea, thank you, and thank the Minister for her response so far. Can the Minister provide an update on when a new chair and board members will be appointed to the Victims and Survivors Board, please? First Minister. Yeah, the current uh, board's second term ended on the 31st of March um, 2024, so this year just, just gone, uh, along with one other board member. Officials are currently considering interim arrangements should the chair position be vacant for a period of time. A competition to fill these vacancies was launched on the 15th of January and closed applications on the 2nd of February. So although the VSS is not a regulated body under the Capani um, guidelines, the appointment process is being undertaken in the spirit of the code. So it's hoped that the new chair members will be announced very shortly. Hello, Harry Harvey. Speaker, question number nine, First Minister. First Minister. Um, with your permission, then I'll answer number nine and ten together. If ten's not been removed. Um, the Deputy First Minister and I travel to Washington to represent the four party executive and its shared objectives. The US represents enormous opportunities for us. It remains our largest and most important source of inward foreign direct investment. 260 US-owned businesses operate here, and they employ over 30,000 people. So that shows the, the potential that we have to build on there. Our decision to travel to the US at the earliest opportunity was to seek out investors and companies and to demonstrate that we are, in fact, open for business and committed to building stability and prosperity through investment. The Deputy First Minister and I had a very positive experience meeting business leaders from a wide range of sectors who were left with a very clear understanding as to why they should invest here. We used our engagements in Washington to deliver a clear message that we are an attractive investment opportunity for global companies because of our talented workforce, dual market access with the EU and innovative homegrown companies. We highlighted our strengths that we have, particularly in relation to sectors such as cyber security, reg tech, fintech, advanced manufacturing and health sciences 
with a young, skilled and dedicated workforce. And we also impressed upon President, President Biden that we appreciate the continued support, including the work taken forward by Special Envoy Joe Kennedy III. Over the coming months, we can, will continue to build on these connections that we've made in order to grow our economy for the betterment of our citizens. We now move to topical questions. I call Matthew Till. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, First Minister, uh, uh, just earlier on, you said that a programme for government you hoped would be uh, ready to be delivered at some point, possibly in the summer. There are a range of motions that have been uh, debated, including many submitted by your party thus far since we returned on making, making, affordable child, making child care affordable, ending violence against women and girls, making school uniforms more affordable, addressing workers' rights. Many of these were heavily publicised, placed on the order paper. Question, and voted for here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask whether these uh, commitments are actually going to be legislated on with financial commitments in a new programme for government? First Minister. Well, can I, just, I thank the member who has uh, just recently written to myself and the Deputy First Minister in terms of some of these issues. So I can, as I said, earlier confirmed that we are working our pace through the programme for government. We want to get it right um, and it will include the priorities that I have identified previously. You have just noted some of those. I think it is important that, um, that we deliver on what we say we are going to deliver, uh, that we understand the financial context in which we are working in. Um, so that is why I think that ideally, of course, we want to get um, to a point where we have a programme for government and a budget aligned and it is multi-year. Um, that is, of course, where everybody would want to be. Um, unfortunately, we are dealing with the, the confines of of the current Treasury rules, um, but who knows where that will be in the future. For now, the executive's focus is around the programme for government, and of course it is the ownership of all of the collective executive parties, and it needs to reflect the shared priorities of the executive, um, some of which you have, um, as I said, just referred to. But we are working on a draft document. Um, it will have the, the list of priorities, and we will move at pace, and we will also be writing to the, the member as well to follow up on just the letter that he had previously sent. Sure, Thank you, First Minister. On uh, a separate but related issue, uh, just before recess, in a written statement that was not uh, delivered orally to the, uh, ex to the Assembly, the uh, Minister of Education <coughs> pointed uh, the serving uh, Justice Department Perm Secretary to be uh, Chief Executive of the Education Authority. He has confirmed to me in a written answer that there was no internal troll. It would appear uh, that this appointment uh, did not follow the updated guidance um, outlined in the RHI I inquiry. The question, can, I ask, Hill, um, can I ask or, or, the First or, or Minister or the you about this appointment beforehand, whether she supports it? Thank you. Uh, well, firstly, let me say neither myself or the Deputy First Minister had um, any role in the appointment process. It is a matter for um, HR and internal practices, and it is a matter for the Education Minister. So I encourage the member to direct his questions that way. Solis Kimmins. Uh, I want to welcome the, the, this morning's meeting of the North South Ministerial Council, the first since 2021 um, in Armagh. And I just wanted to ask, um, does the First Minister agree with me that the North South Ministerial Council is a core component of the Good Friday Agreement? First Minister. Yes, th thanks to the member for that. I mean, yes, it's a really important part of the jigsaw. So now that we have the executive up and functioning, our assemblies meeting, we're discussing the matters of the day. It's also important that we get all pieces of the jigsaw put back together, and that includes the North South Ministerial Council. Um, I'm very glad that uh, we had our first uh, meeting, the first meeting that we actually that we've had in three years this morning. The meeting ran on because we actually had quite a lot to talk about, but I think our people are best served whenever all the institutions and all the apparatus of the Good Friday Agreement is working, and that includes on a north-south and an east-west uh, basis also. So we've had our um, executive restored North South Ministerial Council meeting. We're going to have a British Irish Council meeting uh, in June also. So I think this morning was very much a positive statement in terms of all the areas of collaboration that we have. And we discussed, you know, I'll not get into listing everything because I'll leave something out, but we discussed everything across um, from the infrastructure projects such as the A5, you know, the, the Ulster Canal. Um, we talked about how we're going to work together across health, education. We talked about childcare. We talked about quite a range of areas. And, to me, on this 25th anniversary of the establishment of North-South Bodies, this is a good opportunity for a refresh in terms of all those areas of collaboration. Ms Kimmins. Good, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. So, based on that, um, can the First Minister give her assessment of the huge potential in coming out of, of today's meeting and what progress we may see then in the time ahead? Good. First Minister. Kind of stole your thunder, nearly moving on to that. <laughs> um, but yes, it was a it was a good meeting. It was a productive meeting. Um, it's good to get it back in place. It's an important 
um, part of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and really, the whole focus of it is around delivery, around the key projects and the key areas that we have identified, as I said, across health, education, the economy. Um, all ministers are now going to go off into their sectoral formats and will meet across their specific area of interest. But I really look forward to making progress. And as we work collectively through the institutions, I think we can do good things in terms of building the better future for the people who live across this island, particularly around these areas of um, collaboration and where we can work in partnership. Paul George Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the First Minister for an update on the legislation for an inquiry into mother and baby homes. Mr. Thank you um, for, for that question. And we're continuing to work our way um, through this. Um, we're going to bring our legislative programme to the executive in the coming weeks. This will obviously be one of the areas that falls under the remit of uh, my uh, department. And I am certainly determined to, that we get the legislation over the line as quickly as possible, because these people have waited for far too long. Um, and we don't want there to be any delays in terms of us being able to get to the point where we have the legislation to bring for, for debate. I hope that we can do that and do it well. Um, I personally am meeting some, uh, mother, uh, some of the mother and baby homes, uh, people who have been advocates for all of this change that has been happening over the last number of years and all the rightful recognition of the wrong that was caused to them. Um, and I just want to give them our assurances that we're going to bring this forward as quickly as possible. I call the to it. Uh, I thank the First Minister for her response. Um, I would just be anxious and keen to ensure that the inquiry includes protection for, for burial sites, which is especially urgent given concerns around the ongoing work at Milltown Cemetery, which is potentially causing <coughs> damage to the resting place of thousands, including, according to Amnesty International, potentially hundreds of babies from mother and baby homes. First Minister. I concur with that, with that point. Um, this is such a sensitive issue. Um, decades people have been waiting to, uh, to get recognition of what happened. Um, thankfully, we've made some progress, but we certainly have more to do. But I absolutely take on board the point that you make in terms of making sure that we are protecting burial places. Uh, question four is withdrawn. I call Alan Chambers. My question is along the same lines as Ms Kimmins' uh, question, and it's to ask the First Minister for her assessment of the economic value of the meeting earlier today of the North-South Ministerial Council. First Minister. Yeah, thank you for that and uh, congratulations on your elevation to the policing board. I believe that was announced earlier today. Um, so, yeah, economic value, absolutely. I mean, we, we live on a small island. Uh, we had both the economy and enterprise ministers um, across both jurisdictions talking today about the opportunities that there are in terms of growing the all-island economy, in terms of growing the economies across our islands. Um, and I think there are huge opportunities for us here to work uh, collaboratively and going forward. I know that the uh, economy minister referenced um, today that there are opportunities for Invest NI to work with Enterprise Ireland, to work with uh, Intertrade Ireland, and that they can look towards joint missions in terms of, again, looking towards that economic opportunity to create better prosperity. So I think there's huge actual opportunities for us, and, and I'm glad that we were able to discuss that at the North South Ministerial Council this morning. Mr. Chambers. Thank you, uh, thank you, Minister, for that. And yeah, given the, re the renewed uh, cooperation on East-West issues, is the Minister confident that Northern Ireland's economy will benefit from these opportunities for dialogue regarding East-West and North-South trade? First Minister. Yes, dialogue is the key to making everything work. Um, so I think that the more conversations we can have, the more joined up we can be, have, we, we can be, particularly across these two islands. I think that that will be to the mutual beneficial. Uh, of, of all the people that we collectively serve. Prosperity, prosperity, prosperity is what we all should be focused on. We had a conversation earlier about shared societies, about building shared communities. Let's lift everybody up. That will bring everybody up and that will actually create a better shared space for us all. So I think that there are huge opportunities for the time ahead and I hope that we all have the political will in which to, to grasp them. I think that that certainly was evident this morning. Yeah, Minister for answers so far. I note that the First and Deputy First Minister, along with the Deira Minister, visited Loch Ney recently. And uh, at the Committee for Infrastructure, uh, we heard from the NI Water CEO. He said that overspills are contributing to the issues at Loch Ney. So what will the First Minister do at the executive table to ensure these overspills are addressed? First Minister. Thank you for that question, and, and as the member knows now, the executive has said that Loch Ney is one of our priorities, and we also know that there's no, unfortunately, there's no quick fix. There's going to need to be investment. There's going to be need to be short, medium, and longer-term plans. 
But the fact that myself and the Deputy First Minister and the DERA Minister went out on to site to meet with the Loch Ness Partnership last week was to demonstrate the Executive's commitment to taking on the collective problems that we have, because this will not fall to one department in this uh, Executive. This will fall to many departments, whether that's wastewater infrastructure, in terms of agriculture runoff, in terms of the zebra mussel issue, the blue-green algae, which is a, a European problem, probably a worldwide problem, not, but specifically not just a Loch Ness problem. Um, so I hope that that gives some assurances that whilst we move towards the plans of which the dear Minister will be bringing some to the Executive around environmental improvement plans, a Loch Ness specific plan, um, but that will be for him to talk about in his own right. But just to say that's the kind of volume of work that we are undertaking. And actually further to that, at the North-South Ministerial Council meeting this morning, both myself and the Deputy First Minister had a conversation previous to the meeting and then brought it into the meeting around the need to share um, innovation, research and experience around what's happening in Loch Ness. Um, and there was an agreement to advance that piece of work. So perhaps there will be something very good that will come from that in terms of the, the so identifying the problems, the research, innovation and just that sharing of knowledge I think is going to be crucially important. Thank you to the First Minister. Um, protection of our waterways is obviously key in terms of Loch Ness, but overspills is an issue in waterways across Northern Ireland, for example, Loch Erne, River Blackwater. Uh, will you be ensuring that protection of our waterways will be key in programme for government? First Minister. Yes, I, I've said that we will prioritise Loch Ness, but I think that there are individual responsibilities that will fall to each of our, all of our other executive colleagues around the executive table, so let them bring their expertise and their skill set and their executive papers. But They'll not be found, we'll not be found wanting in terms of supporting us all doing whatever we can to arrest the situation that is currently um, faced. We've, the report's been published. We know what the challenges are. The big challenge for us is going to be how do we turn that around? How do we fix the problem given the financial constraints that we're, that we're under? That's why the financial argument is still crucially the number one important argument for us. Call Robbie Butler. Speaker, I'd just like to take the opportunity to uh, say well done to the First and Deputy First Minister in terms of the start that they've made to their tenure in the Executive Office, but I would like to ask the First Minister what steps the Executive Office have taken to ensure pre-emptive and proactive scrutiny of all EU legislation uh, and, and will be done in a timely manner. First Minister. Well, as the, the Member knows, we now have a, a, a committee established which is going to have a remit of scrutinising all of this work comes to ourselves first, we have a decision to make and then it can come to the floor of the House. So this is a new arrangement for us all and I think we're working our way through it. We've had two such debates in this Assembly Chamber so far, um, but I think it's important that uh, we work our way through these as they come, but we don't want to tie ourselves up constantly on these issues. But clearly where there are issues of significance or that we want to discuss, then we should we have the forum now, we should take it to discuss them. Mr Butler. Thank the First Minister for, for her answer. Um, would the Executive Office be working to minimise um, further divergence uh, with regard to uh, UK-wide legislation uh, as a methodology? Minister. Look, I think it's important that we, are, that we work our way through this in a pragmatic sense, that we take into account the needs of business. If Brexit's going to tell us anything, it is that if we don't listen to the needs of those people in industry who are challenged every day by the implications of the outworking of all of that, then we're not learning lessons. So I would like to think that we can take a very pragmatic approach about um, how we move forward. Uh, will we always agree? That's yet to be tested, but sure, let's, let's work our way through it and let's do it with, with the intention of trying to do the right thing by the, the business community that we're all trying to help to prosper, to grow, because ultimately that helps uh, our whole economy prosper and our people prosper. Tom Elliott. Speaker, and uh, the First Minister did mention about uh, the Ulster Canal being on the agenda today. Well, could you give us an update on that, please? Minister. Yeah, just to say that um, obviously the, the member will have a keen interest in this, uh, given his proximity to it. But um, yes, it was raised again today in terms of how we're going to make progress. But there'll be a fuller report to the Assembly Chamber in terms of the outworking of what we did today. Today's meeting was about taking a stock of where we've got to and then what the, the imminent plans are. But um, there will be further sectoral meetings to get into the in-depth detail around the next stage of the Ulster Canal. But there was huge enthusiasm in terms of making sure that we fulfil the commitments that have previously been made and that we advance the project and move on to the next stage. Mr Elliott. Thank you and thank the, the First Minister for that. The, there is a slight problem in, in a community facility in, in the area where it's going very close to it and it may require removal. Is there any discussions available still around uh, the slight movement of it? Obviously, yes, sir. So that wasn't discussed today, um, but I'm happy to uh, ensure that you get a, a written response if that's been raised. But perhaps you might want to write to the office just to highlight whatever the challenge is, and I'm happy to get us to look at that. 
Um, that concludes topical questions to the First Minister. We now move to the Education Minister, and the first question is Mr Stuart Dixon.